Well, good morning, folks, and uh, welcome back to 3Zen. Nice to see everyone here this morning. So this morning, I'm going to begin talking about Veterans Day. It's a very special day to me. Um, I'm proud of my country. I'm proud of my service. And I'm proud of the veterans I affiliate and associate with. About, uh, oh, seven years ago, eight years ago, perhaps, I was given the opportunity to speak at uh, my grandson's school on Veterans Day. And I kind of toyed around with what I was going to say on veter about Veterans Day and um, batted a couple ideas back and forth. And then I settled on a presentation enlightening these kids what it was like to be a military brat. And that's a little bit different twist to the uh, typical Veterans Day presentation. So what I did... Uh, in this school, they had grades, I think, pre-K or K through 8. So what I did is I made some notes about where I was during each grade. And uh, when I went to talk to the individual classes, there must have been eight of them, I guess. Seven classes. A couple of them were combined, but about seven, seven classes, seven presentations that day. I would take um, where they were and relate it to where I was at that time, at that particular time. So I'll give you an example. In first, second, and third grade, I was in Okinawa. So I told the first, second, and third graders what it was like growing up on Okinawa. Um, I had maps to show them where it was. I talked about uh, a little bit about the Japanese War. We lived there... Um, we moved in about seven years after the war, eight years after the war. We were the first people to live on base housing on our particular house on Kadena. And I told them a little bit about what it was like to, to uh, interface with the Japanese. Um, I told them we had two Japanese maids, Yoshiko and Naiko, and um, that uh, they lived with us um, for a while. And I told them about learning to speak a little Japanese because, you know, when you're that young, you don't have any reservations. You'll, you'll speak whatever, you, whatever comes to you, if you will. We're not that self-conscious. I wish I'd have paid more attention to it, but be that as it may, it was what it was. They wanted to hear some Japanese, so I had to go to the memory banks and came up with Konnichiwa, Ohio gozaimasu, Ichi ni sanchigo roko sichi hachikuju. And they were just enthralled. I don't know what they, I don't know quite what I said, but it sounded good to them. And uh, told them a couple funny stories. And then we moved on to fourth and fifth grade in um, Davis Month in Tucson, Arizona. And at that time, I told the fourth and fifth graders what it was like to play in the boneyard where they, uh, in Tuc at Tucson, where we store obsolete aircraft. I told them about, we didn't have a fence around the boneyard in those days. So I came out of my house, went across the street and down a, down a little stretch of road. It wasn't very long at all. Um, and then I was in the boneyard. There was, like I said, there was no fence. And we would just go through the different aircraft and crawl on them, crawl in them, and just had a ball. Um, I told them it was there. I got my first 19 MIG kills sitting in the cockpit of one of those old airplanes. And it was just a thrill to play like that. I told them about hunting for prairie dogs, about, oh my God, taking uh, wagons. We would take our wagons, fill them, fill, put a couple garbage cans in them, and fill the, the garbage cans full of water. And then we would go out that same road to the boneyard, but instead of going into the boneyard, we hang a right and go into the desert. And we'd find prairie dog holes. They weren't hard to find. And we would, we, I think we had burlap sacks at that time. We'd take the uh, garbage can full of water, pour it down a hole in the hopes of forcing a, a prairie dog up an, another hole. So we had a couple guys stationed around a couple close holes. Um, sometimes we'd see these prairie dogs a little bit further away, standing outside their burrows, looking at us. And they must have been thinking, what a bunch of dumbasses. But anyway, 
I don't know how much water I poured down the desert out there, but it was fun. And uh, I look back at it now and just shake my head. It was fun. I told him about, um, oh, a couple of other things. I told him about seeing B-47s fly and, and uh, things like that. From uh, Davis Monthan, we moved to Ramey, Puerto Rico, and that was an enchanting tour. And I told him a little bit about uh, learning to speak Spanish there. Although it's not very well, I did learn a little bit of Spanish. I told them about um, how we would have practice uh, nuclear drills where we would lo load up on buses. They'd take us off base about five, six, seven miles off base and then into a sugarcane field. Now think about it. If a nuke lit off on Ramey, do you think at five, six, seven miles out in a sugarcane field we were going to survive? I don't think so. We would have been sweet, crispy critters. But anyway, I always thought it was a lot more fun being out in that sugar cane field, chewing on raw sugar cane than under a desk, um, hunkering down with a, with a bunch of other kids. But anyway, at Ramey, um, they had a pool, their officer's club pool, and we swam every day in that pool. And then we go down to the beach, unsupervised, totally unsupervised, and play on the beach for hours down behind the um, officer's club. So I told him what that was like. Um, then from Ramey, we moved up to uh, Westover, Massachusetts, <coughs> excuse me, and um, stayed there for two years. There I enlightened him about the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's where I heard Kennedy talking about the... Uh, Castro and the Cuban Missile Crisis and so forth. From there, in 1962, we were assigned to Chamblay Air Force Base, France. Um, that was another very interesting tour. I told them about um, traveling from uh, Chamblay to Verdun, is where, where we went to uh, school, went to 11th grade. And uh, that was 29 miles one way. We would get on the bus about 6.15 in order to get there at 8 o'clock or 7.30, whatever it was. Um, 29 miles across dilapidated uh, French roads that were really in um, great dis, dis, um, disrepair. One of the things I still remember today is traveling by a minefield. And, uh, they had barbed wire oh, maybe three, two and a half, three feet tall, all across this field. And on the front of the field was a sign in German that said, Achtung meinen. And uh, the French in those days were, they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of manpower. And so when it came to fields like that, they would get to them when they could. But at that time, that minefield just sat out there with active mines in it. From World War One or World War Two, I wouldn't have a clue. But... Um, there it sat. In our school at Verdun, I had a picture of it, was an old, I think, World War I um, hospital. And we took up two wings of, of that hospital, two or three wings of it for our classrooms. So that was a dreary trip. Um, we'd get to the school and we'd travel in, in uh, darkness. And at 4.30, it got dark. That's when we traveled home. But, you know, I wouldn't trade that experience for all the Franks in the world. And then from there, uh, after a year, we went up to um, uh, Wiesbaden, West Germany. That was a great uh, place for, to finish my senior year. And I shared some experience, what it was like living in Wiesbaden. Um, a couple of uh, playing on a soccer team and... Um, playing soccer with the Germans. We never won a game, but um, they would take us out to drink beer after the game, and that was okay. If I had to run around a grass field for a while to drink uh, German beer, I'd do that. And then I talked to them a little bit about I came back and told them some of the things that happened on base. Like when we went to the movies, they at the base theater on base, they always started out with a Star Spangled Banner, and we would stand up. 
without without question, without thought. You always stood up for the Star Spangled Banner being played. And um, then driving across base at um, retreat, when they'd play retreat, we'd pull off the side of the road. Some bases had you get out. Some bases, and put your hand over your heart. Some bases had you, um, the driver could just stay in the car and so forth. But what I wanted to try to do was to give them an, um, the, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, feel for patriotism that we felt that was integral to our life. Um, pride in our country, pride in our nation, pride in each other, pride in our military. Uh, not something that we bragged about, but it was something that was instilled in us as children that I still carry to this day. Um, I can tell you without reservation, I love my, my association with military brats. I love my association with military veterans, with our veterans. I have been so blessed in this life to be uh, associated with both. Uh, sometimes, well like myself and many, many hundreds of thousands of other were inseparable. You don't get one without the other. At any rate, I would like to take the opportunity here, if you've heard something uh, on this uh, entry, to uh, perhaps encourage you to reach out to a school and offer to, to talk to the school about either your veteran experience or your uh, military brat experience. It is a very, very rewarding um, exercise if you if you're invited to do that and I'll tell you something uh, if you receive 216 thank you letters that's impressive at any rate uh, I salute the veterans today and I salute the military brats so thanks for tuning in good to see you and uh, we'll see you soon on another video <laughs>